Last week, I started talking to you uh, a subject called, uh, I just titled it, Essential Truths for the Believer. Essential Truths for the Believer. And, and, the, and these, are, these are truths that I believe that, that every believer must have working in their life, must have evident in their life. Um, church is much more than just coming once a week, twice a week to hear uh, just a message and then to go right back out and feel that you've done your religious duty for the week. Uh, you've, you've heard a good message and, and now that, that, that's ready for you for the rest of the week. No, it's, it's much more than that. It's much more. Jesus did not come, die, was buried, and was raised from the dead so that you could go to church. Jesus came, died, was buried, and raised from the dead so that you could be the church. Right. Amen. And so, uh, so it's necessary for us to, to look at some of these e uh, essential truths because as we, as we talk about the year coming, uh, coming up, as we talk about uh, kind of where we're headed, you know, as a, as a body of believers, then... Unless we, unless we know what our foundation is, unless we know what those essential truths are, then we might miss the mark. We might start majoring on minor things. And a lot of churches, a lot of times can, uh, they can begin majoring on minor doctrines, majoring on minor things. And so they miss the mark of what it means to, uh, to be a disciple maker. And, and so what happens by and large is that a lot of times um, there's just, uh, the church never grows to the place spiritually that God intended it to grow. Amen. So last week, and I won't really recap um, very much, but last week uh, I, I went through two different essential truths. One, essential truth number one was that you must be, every believer must be established in grace and truth. Every believer must be established in grace and truth. The grace that comes from God, the truth which is his word, you must be established in. We find over in John chapter 1 that it says that the law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And it says that Jesus was full of grace and truth, and out of his fullness have we all received. And so if there's anything, if you want to receive anything from God in your life, if you want to receive uh, healing, if you want to receive peace, if you want to uh, uh, receive freedom from guilt, shame, and condemnation, if you want to experience the kingdom of God and live in the kingdom of God, if you want to uh, experience financial prosperity, if you want to experience anything, the abundant life that Jesus came for you, then you must know that it comes out of his fullness, which is his grace and which is his truth. And if you're not established in those things, if you're not established in the righteousness of God and know that you have been made righteous and that it's not according to your own works, but it's only according to his love, his great love with which he loved us. Hallelujah. And you stay firm in that, then you can begin to receive the fullness of what God intends for you to have. Amen. So you must be grace. Uh, I, I said this last week. Grace is the full expression of God's love to us. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Essential truth number two was every believer must live a life of faith. Life of faith church. See what I did there? <laughs> every, every believer must live a life of faith. Because it says, uh, the scripture here that I had read, oh, let's see here. I love this scripture right here. Um, verse, uh, it's uh, Romans chapter 5, verse 2. It says, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. We have access into the grace access into everything that God has provided us. We have access to that only one way, and that's by faith. And so if you haven't learned how to live a life of faith every day, 
Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And for you, living by faith means just what, what you do on Sunday morning or what you do on Wednesday night. Um, then you're falling well short of what God's intention is for you. Amen. Amen. So uh, that's essential truth number two. You must learn to live a life of faith. We'll talk about those things later, but I've, uh, I've got to go through these, these other essential truths. got quite a bit of ground to cover this morning. Okay. So once you're established in grace and truth, once you understand what it means to, to live your life by faith, then here's the next thing that is so often missed, I believe, in, 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 in Christians' lives and believers' lives. God intended for every believer, this is essential truth number three, God intended for every believer to hear his voice. And not just to hear his voice occasionally or once a year or once every few years at big pivotal moments in their life, but God intended for every believer to hear his voice every day. And I think that by and large, the majority of the body of Christ, the majority of Christians do not have a relationship with their father to where they are hearing his voice every single day. Amen. But I'm telling you, just because you're not experiencing that does not mean that he does not intend for you to experience that. Do not move your doctrine to match your experience. Move your experience to match the doctrine, to match the word. Amen. Check this out. John chapter 10, verse 27. This is what Jesus said. He said, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. Are you his sheep? Yes. Then you hear his voice. And he says, I know them and they follow me. John chapter 18, verse 37 says, everyone that is of the truth hears my voice. Well, what is the truth? Uh, Jesus said, to, he said, Father, your word is truth. So everyone that is of the word, the word of really there is talking about being born. The Bible says that we have been born of incorruptible, the incorruptible seed of the word of God. If you've been born again, if you are, if you are a Christian, if you are a child of God, you have been born of the truth. And now if you will live your life by the truth, he says here, everyone that is of the truth, born of the truth, hears my voice. Revelations chapter 3, verse 20. Jesus said this. Again, the, all three of these is what Jesus said. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Hearing the voice of God. This morning, I'm just going to go through, as we go through these essential truths, just for you, uh, um, I just want to go through a lot of scripture this morning. Is that okay? Let's let the word of God uh, declare some things to us this morning. I don't want to spend a lot of time expounding upon it. I want these truths to come straight from the word of God and to penetrate your heart, to penetrate, you, go through your mind. I want you to see what the word of God is saying for you as a believer. Let let the Spirit of God paint a picture for you of what He wants your life to be. Hallelujah. The agent, for, how do we hear the voice of God? The agent by which we hear the voice of God is the Holy Spirit. And this is important. The agent that we hear, by which we hear the voice of God is the Holy Spirit. He says here, but the comforter which is, this is John chapter 14, verse 26, but the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I've said unto you. This is one of the reasons why the doctrine of the baptism of the Holy Spirit has been so attacked over the years is because Satan wants to get in between of the Christian's ability to be taught directly by the Holy Spirit. 
Do you know that John said in 1 John, he said that in one place, he said, you don't have need to that man teach you because you have an unction, you have an anointing from the Holy Spirit and he will lead you, he will guide you, he will teach you all things. I believe one of the, uh, one of the greatest tragedies in the church today is that pastors do not do an effective job of leading people to the Holy Spirit and, and, and relying on and listening to and being taught by the Holy Spirit themselves. Pastors Pastors tend to be insecure in their thinking, and so they think they're the ones that is to lead and to guide the sheep. But Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. Amen. And so even John, or even Paul said this, he said, he said, I am confident that he that began a good work in you will complete it to the day of Christ. Paul and John had so much faith in the Holy Spirit to talk to people, in the Holy Spirit to complete the work in people, glory to God, that they didn't, they, they weren't so caught up with the fact that, you know, it, it, it was up to them to lead and guide people, you know, but by and large, people always are, are tend to look to just the pastor or just the minister or the television preacher to lead them, to guide them for a word and, 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 and not growing up to the place that they hear the voice of God every day on their own. This church, we exist to, to help you connect with your Father God and to hear His voice every day. There's no greater joy than to know that you're walking in the will of your Father every single day. And experiencing his goodness in your life. Amen. Amen. I can't hear for each and every one of you. I can multitask, but I'm not that good. <laughs> so it's, it's up to you. It's up to you to, to do what is necessary to hear the voice of God. Let me show you some examples. Because um, by, by the, the disciples, when they, when they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, when they were infilled with the Holy Spirit... Because Jesus had said, it's, it's better for you that I go away so that I can send the Holy Spirit to you. Because you know what? Even though they were with Jesus for three years, they weren't with him 24 hours a day. But the Holy Spirit is there with you 24 hours a day. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Let me give you a few examples. Acts chapter 10, verse 19. While Peter thought on the vision... The Spirit said to him, I want you to see how specific this is. The Spirit said to him, behold, three men seek you. That wasn't just a general, you're going to be blessed today, Peter. Yeah. <laughs> that so many of us tend to, <laughs> tend to walk by. We, we get these general voices from the Holy Spirit, you know, or general scriptures and say, that's for me. But I want you to see how specific and how how much, how detailed the Holy Spirit would like to be in your life. He said, the three, he said there's three men that's seeking you. And then he went on to tell him, said, just go on and, and, and don't doubt anything. Look at Acts chapter 13, verse 2. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said. Now, this, was in a, this actually happened in a, in a meeting in a church environment where they were ministering to the Lord they had set aside a time of fasting just, uh, and again, fasting, I said it last week, uh, fasting is something that uh, if, you want, if you want to get your flesh out of the way so that you can hear better and put your, put your body under subjection, <laughs> let me tell you a story. This has nothing to do with the message, but it was just a thought. So uh, uh, when we took Arthur Menjes out to eat after, after service on, back in December, and we're sitting there, we took him over to Papa Do's. And Papa Do's, they give you, a, uh, they give you big, uh, big portions, right? And so, and so we're eating, and, and, and we've still got food on the plate. And, man, we're slowing down. I'm getting full. <laughs> and he said, he said, you know, he said, you know, Mark, he said, uh, the Bible says to put your body under subjection. He said, you know, the way I view that, I just tell my body, I don't care if you don't want another bite or not, you will finish this food. 
I will put you under subjection. <laughs> Hallelujah. Some of, y'all, some of y'all are going to use that for lunch today, I know. <laughs> so fasting is that time that you do the opposite of putting your body under subjection. You're, you're just getting it out of the way and, and saying, I'm really just I'm setting myself to hear what, what God is saying in my life. Um, you're not fasting. You don't fast to get God to do something. Right. You don't fast. You know, for, you don't fast for breakthrough. That's right. That's right. Breakthrough happened 2,000 years ago right. through the person of Jesus Christ. And and so what you'll find even in the New Testament when they were fasting, uh, the Holy Spirit was talking to them during that time. So here it says that as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said. Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. So the Holy Spirit is the one that's giving direction, that's giving guidance. And this is the way the early church lived their life. They expected to be led and guided by the voice of the Holy Spirit in their life. Let's look at our walk in the Spirit. Uh, uh, chapter, uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 14 says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And so here he's giving us an indication that we, our lives, essentially our lives, that we need to be led by the Spirit of God. Well, if he's not talking, then how can we be led? But since he's talking to us, that's the way that we're led. He's talking to us. He's leading us. He wants to lead us every single day. Hallelujah. Galatians 5.25 says, if we live in the Spirit... See, living in the Spirit, that's where we are. Jesus put us there in the heavenlies. We're seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Uh, Colossians 2.10 says, you are complete in Him. So our position uh, spiritually is in Christ. And so it says that for if we live in the Spirit, then let us also walk in the Spirit. See, living in the Spirit, that's where we are. But now you have a decision every day as to whether or not you're going to walk in the Spirit. Earlier in that ver- uh, chapter, it says, if you walk in the Spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. He didn't focus on the not doing. He focused on what we should be doing. And that's being led, uh, led that's being guided by the Holy Spirit, walking in the Spirit every single day. And there are ways that you can, uh, uh, can, can help or be transformed in a way that you'll hear his voice every single day. We're not going to get into, into practical steps to listening to the voice of God. I'm just painting for you some essential truths of what your life as a believer needs to be. Hallelujah. This is what God designed you to be. Amen. So he says, if we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. So it is every believer should be hearing the voice of God. And not just hearing, because hearing is one thing, following is another. Being led by the Spirit is a two-step process. It's hearing His voice, but then it's also following His voice. And out of that, you'll hear more, and you'll hear more, and you'll experience more, and you'll experience more. But sometimes we have selective hearing. God will tell you to do something, and you don't like what he said to do. And so you'll say, no, I'm just not going to do that. I'll just pretend, you know, talk to the hand, the face isn't listening, or whatever it is. I'm just not going to do that in my life because I don't want to. And so, you know, so sometimes, depending on where you are in your life, God doesn't need to tell you anything different because you haven't done the last thing that he said to do to you. Or to, or to do for you. You know, it's not, it's not selective obedience. It's not that God says, oh, okay, well, you know, Wendy didn't want to do that part, so let me just tell her to do something different. I'm just using you as an example. <laughs> okay. uh, you know, or, or whoever, you know. I mean, it's, you know, God's, God says, no, I know what's best for your life. And so I'm not going to change what I've said to you So you better get on board and just listen to what I have to say and follow me because what I have for you is way better than what you could ever do for yourself. Amen. All right. So hearing the voice of God, important. Uh, Essential truth number four. 
don't have a really good way of, of, of phrasing this except to say that um, every believer should be activated in their gifts. Absolutely. Every believer should be activated in their gifts. What do I mean by that? It's, it's giving people opportunity to use their gifts in significant ways for others. Okay? The gospel and what Jesus did is, is for you absolutely, but it's also to be through you to others. And, and many times Christians stop at the me part and what Jesus did for me. And they, and, and they don't realize that there's great gifts that, that God has given them for the benefit of others. We were not created, I wrote this down, we were not created to be passive recipients of God's grace. Let me say that again. We were not created to be passive recipients of God's grace, but rather to be active participants in expressing his grace and building the body of Christ. Yes. Ephesians 2.10 says this, for we are his workmanship. <laughs> I love that phrase. I am his workmanship. And God doesn't do anything halfway. He doesn't do anything partly. I mean, if you look at yourself and you see yourself as incomplete, then you're seeing yourself with the wrong view in mind. Because you are his workmanship. And he gets it right every single time. That's why Colossians 2.10 says you are complete in him. You're not, you're, 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 you're not a, a second class. You're not a second class citizen in the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven doesn't have second class citizens. In the kingdom of heaven, there is no male. There is no female. There is no black. There is no white. It doesn't matter. There is no poor. There is no rich. Everybody, everybody's rich actually is the way it is in the kingdom of heaven because he's given us all things, amen, richly to enjoy. There is no, there, there, there is no different, different steps in the society of, king, uh, uh, of the kingdom of heaven. Isn't that awesome? You don't have to climb a ladder. You've already made it to the top. You are seated at the right hand of your Father God, and you are His workmanship. You're His workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. You're created for a purpose. You have now a purpose in your life. You are created to do good works. You're not created to sit. You're created to do something. See, when we say resting in God, we don't mean resting on your tail. We're, we're talking about resting as we, as we do things. Jesus was in the, in the ship, asleep, on his way to his next assignment. He stayed in that place of rest. You can stay in a place of rest and peace while you're doing what God has said to do. Glory to God. And as you're doing it, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. You know, when um, the disciples came to Jesus, he was talking to this woman, and, and they said, uh, you know, do you need food or what? Um, this was in John chapter 4. He said, my meat is to do the will of my Father. There is nourishment that comes. There is rest that comes. There is strength that comes out of doing what God has called you to do, out of doing uh, uh, what God has graced you to do, that when you're in that place, that that grace, it will feed into you. It'll give you the strength. The power of the Holy Spirit will operate in you, will operate through you, and God will sustain you to the point that if you don't eat or whatever, the Spirit of God is there. There's examples in the Bible of how people were nourished, how people, I mean, even Jesus during that 40 days of fasting, when the devil came to him and tried to tempt him, said, you know, uh, if you are the Son of God, command these stones to be made bread. Jesus said, man shall not live 
live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Why? The word of God is alive. It's life-giving. It's powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. And even in the middle of doing what God has called you to do and what he has told you to do, and you're being activated in the gifts that God has given you, there's grace for that. There's rest in that. Let me tell you, when you will not be in a place of rest, it is when you are sitting and not doing what God has gifted you and called you to do. You will be uneasy. You will not experience peace. You will be at a state of unrest because that's what God, that's not, God never intended for us just to sit, just to be recipients but to be active participants to express his grace. Amen? Amen. We'll read a few more scriptures on that. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Galatians 6.10. As we therefore, as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. 1 Corinthians 12, 7. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man. The manifestation, and in this chapter he's talking about the gifts of the Spirit, is given to every man to profit everybody. And then I love 1 Peter 4, 10. It's one of my favorite scriptures right now. As every man has received a gift, even so minister the same one to another. Now, you know, if you've been here for a little bit, that that word gift is charisma in the Greek. The Greek word for grace is charis. And charisma is charis and just adding the M-A to it. And it's, it literally means a result that comes from grace. A result that comes from grace. And, and so when God graced you, when he gave you his grace, he also gave you a gift. And some of you may be here and say, oh, I don't have a gift. I don't know what that gift is. Well, he says here, every person has received a gift. So whether or not you know what it is, maybe that's an issue, and we have to talk about that later, but you have received a gift. The gifts of the Spirit, the gifts of God, isn't reserved for just ministers. It has been given to every believer. Now look at this. As every man has received a gift, even so minister that gift for yourself. No, the gift's not given to you for you. Even so, minister the same one to another, look at this, as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. You are, you, this is good. I love this. The gift that God, whew, come on, Jesus. The gift that God has given you was never meant for you, uh, was never meant to be optional. The gift that God has given you was never meant to lay dormant within you. And you just decide one, one, you know, one day, well, maybe, maybe I do want to you know, use this gift. Maybe I do want to be used from God, or maybe I don't want to be used by God. No, it says here that the gifts that have been given you, they've given you that you could be a good steward you are a steward. A steward handles things for somebody else. That would be like an accountant handling money for a business or something like that. You expect that accountant, you expect that money manager to be a good steward over that. You don't expect that money manager to go out and to start using that money on his behalf. Otherwise, that is called embezzlement. The gifts of the Spirit weren't given to us for us to embezzle or not use. The gifts of the Spirit or the gift that you have is given for you to be a good steward of the grace of God that has been given you. And that's the reason why you have to be established in the grace of God. Because if you don't know what the grace of God is, if you don't know what's been given to you out of the grace of God, then how can you properly steward it? Amen. Hallelujah. Check out Ephesians chapter 4, verse 16. From him, talking about Jesus, the whole body, the church, in all its various parts, 
joined and knitted firmly together, look at this, by what every joint supplies. When each part is working properly. Whew. I love that. He says, from Jesus, the whole body, the church, in all its various parts, they're joined, they're knitted firmly together, but they're knitted firmly together by what each joint supplies. They're not knitted firmly together just because they're part of the body of Christ. They're knitted together through the giftings, through the love, by what each person supplies. And it says, when each part is working properly. And that's what causes the body to grow and mature, building itself up in unselfish love. Hallelujah. The life of a believer is more. We're not islands to ourselves. We are living, functioning members, parts, ligaments of joints of the body of Christ. And we have to do our part for the benefit of others. Hallelujah. So every believer needs to be activated in their spiritual gifting for the benefit of others. That's essential truth number four. Essential truth number five. Relationship. Relationship. We must have relationship. We must have relationship, first of all, with the Father God. What do I mean by that? Relationship with the Father God is hearing His voice, knowing Him every day. That is essential. That is number one. And then number two, we must have real, meaningful relationships with each other. Not Sunday morning relationships. Because Sunday morning relationships are fake in most churches. Hey, brother, how you doing? I am blessed and highly favored and prosperous of God. Everything's going great. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Bless you. And, and, so, and so we tend to be very superficial in our relationships with one another. We don't want people to get involved in our life and to know our business behind the scenes. You know, um, we heard for years, uh, you, I've heard, uh, I still hear it. There are ministers that will teach not to have relationship with people that come to their church. Because for two reasons. One, <laughs> it just tickles me that people can believe this. One, you have to protect the anointing. Whatever the heck that means. As if the yeah, as Jennifer, as if the anointing is so fragile. You know, in my view, the anointing is meant for people, not to be kept from people. But that's just that's just my opinion. Or, or the, this other phrase is familiarity bring uh, breeds contempt. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, don't you? You've heard that, right? Familiarity. <laughs> Breeds contempt. She used to be a, pastor, a pastor's wife as well, so uh, and, and pastor at church. So she's heard this, you know, for years. How many of you have heard that phrase? Familiarity breeds contempt. Uh, I got two hands back there with Patrick, you know. In other words, in other words, and this is the thought: is if people get too close to you and see that you're real, then they will lose respect for your gifting, for your calling, and they'll lose respect for your anointing. The truth of the matter is when people get close to you, they see that you're a hypocrite and you're not living the way that you're preaching from the pulpit and they lose respect for you because of that. Jesus came to be with people. And to be with the multitudes and not to stay separate from people. Familiarity, people should see in my life, people should see in your life somebody that is, you know, maybe you don't do everything perfect. I don't do everything perfect. But, oh. So sorry. Sorry. 
Newsflash. <laughs> Please don't look for another church now. But, but here it is. A newsflash. I don't know of another minister that does everything perfect. Uh, but here, here, what I can tell you is that my heart is perfect towards God. And that, and that I seek him with my whole heart. And that even though I may make mistakes along the way, I can be transparent enough with you and real enough with you to let you know what's going on in my life without pretending that I have it all together. Amen. You know, I would rather stop on a dime in the middle of the service and say, you know what, I think I missed it here. Than to pretend that what I said was right so that you have a good opinion about me. It's not about me. It's about him. Hey, I'm walking, I'm walking this thing out just like you guys are. And it's been glorious and it's been awesome. And I've, been, I've experienced more of God in the last two years than at any other time in my entire life. And that is awesome. But we need to, we need to get rid of this facade and this, this, this mask that we put on in church. And have real, meaningful relationship. So that if somebody calls me and they need prayer, if somebody calls you and they need prayer, then you're not judging them and condemning them because they need prayer. You're right there using the gift of God that is in you and praying and agreeing with them. Discipleship and growth, they happen through relationship. Um, Let me see if I can go through this real quick. Only those that followed Jesus were called disciples. Not the, not the 5,000 that he fed. Not the multitudes that he fed. They weren't called disciples. Only the ones that were in relationship with him. They stayed with him and they lived life with him. John chapter 1, verse 38, Jesus turned and saw them following. At the beginning of his ministry, he said to them, What do you seek? They said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher. Where are you staying? He said, come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day. And so what you find is that Jesus invited people into his life. And the relationship was so real that many times the disciples found out things uh, more in depth, were able to ask him things privately that the multitudes never got the benefit from. See, and so they learned more out of that relationship with him than just going to his meetings. See, look at Mark 9, 9, 28. When he was coming to the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast him out? Talking about a devil. Mm -hmm. They didn't get that answer in, in the multitude. They didn't get that answer in the church service. They got that answer out of relationship. Look at Mark 4, 10 through 11. And when he was alone, they that were about him with the 12 asked him of the parable. He had just taught the parable of the sower. And he said, you have to understand this parable or you won't understand anything. He had just taught that. And he said, unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. But unto them that are without, all these things are done in parables. In other words, those that were in relationship with him are the ones that got inside information. That's why it's so important for you to hear the voice of God. See? But discipleship, him discipling them, came out of relationship. And so 1 Corinthians 1.9 says, God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship, unto the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ the Lord. Now let's look at the early church. Acts chapter 2, verse 40, uh, 42. And they continued steadfastly. Look, they continued steadfastly. They made a decision. They continued steadfastly, the church did, in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. It wasn't just doctrine, it was also fellowship, relationship, and it was steadfast. It was, it was important to the growth of the church and in breaking of bread and in prayers. These are the things that the church, the early church did, and they were steadfast, unmovable about. 
They can, and look at uh, chapter 2, verse 46. This is on down a little bit. They continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. So this is just an example, again, of, of them being a community, of them living in relationship with one another. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 13 says that we as believers, we are to exhort one another how often? Daily. daily. We are to exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. You know, um, I didn't mention the scripture when we were talking about listening to the voice of God. But he said this also in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 15. He said, while it is said today, today, if you will hear his voice. So that means I need to be hearing his voice today. That just came to my mind. Um, but if we're to exhort one another daily, how can we do that if we're not in relationship with one another? How can we do that if we don't know somebody that is, you know, that is sitting next to me or somebody that's sitting behind me? The church, the body of believers, we need to have relationship with one another. And in today's society, um, it's difficult to do. And sometimes, it, even in today's church, it's because of Facebook, social media. Uh, we get so busy with everything that having real meaningful relationship with people. And here's the other thing. Uh, having real mini- meaningful relationship with people is to invite people into your life. And that means that um, you have to, you have to kind of, they, they get to see all the ugly part. And people, by and large, aren't willing to let people, they want to keep areas closed off from people so that they can project a particular image. See? But again, this is the body, and you have to be intentional about relationships so that you can do and be a steward of the grace of God and so that you can do the things that God has gifted you and called you to do. Okay? There's a reason why that the, the, the church, by and large, is splintered and fractured. And it's because they haven't done what is necessary to create real relationship and allow the love of God. See, the love of God will cover a multitude of sins. The love of God will cause relationship to build in in a way. And I promise you, you grow up, you become more mature. You become, uh, uh, you you stop walking around with your feelings on your shoulders. You stop walking around getting in a place where you're offended all the time because somebody didn't say hello to you when you walked in church. You know, and you walk past them, and, and what you don't know is that person has something going on in their mind right. that they just didn't even pay attention to you right at the moment. We got, we, we got too many baby Christians that's just walking around with their feelings on their shoulders all the time and getting mad at the pastor because he said something the wrong way or getting mad at so-and-so because they said something the wrong way or they looked at somebody the wrong way or whatever. Uh, come on, it's time for the body of Christ to grow up. Grow up. Let's be mature. Let's get over that. Because I promise you, as you go into the world, uh, ain't nobody, ain't anybody going to talk to you the right way. So you better learn how to walk in love. Jesus said, the world will know that you're my disciples, not by the love you have for them, but the love that you have for each other. Amen. Amen. So I'll say it again. The world will, uh, the world will not, will know that you're my disciples by the love that you have for each other. Amen. So that's essential truth number, what, five? Relationship, it's important. And then finally, I think that is very, uh, uh, and I'll bring this to a close, I think that it's very, very important. And there's, there, look, there are other things that somebody said, oh, well, you forgot about this or you forgot about that. I'm just talking about things that, that I believe are key for us as, as, as the body of Christ to get because if you get these things, then all the other things that you think I forgot about will come. Okay, and 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 so this 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 is regarding um, our services. I believe that it's very important, essentially, our essential truth that church services need to be spirit led. That that we're not we're not trying to put together a performance. That we're not trying to put together. Uh, 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 just some kind of a some kind of a show that 
that we are in a place that if Selena does like she did this morning, feel like, hey, let's just sing the song a cappella. Let's just, let's just, man, let's just focus. If we need to, if we need, if we need to stop, if we just need to worship for a little bit longer, let's do that. We're not, you know, we're not trying to be out at a particular certain time. Let's, there's people that come in. Yes, amen. Come on. And sometimes I make the mistake of being so time conscious that I, uh, you know, that, that maybe I've had a tendency sometimes to kind of um, quench what the Spirit of God wants to do at a moment. Because I do. I love y'all so much. I want to be very respectful of your time. But there may be somebody that's come in here that's hurting. That, the, that, that they, they need that extra time of worship. We need that presence of God to let God just deal with them in that moment. And we can't be so concerned about ourselves that we're, that we're not allowing the Spirit of God to work in somebody's life. Or maybe in the middle of a service, of course, y'all, y'all see it happening with me all the time, is that the Holy Spirit says, no, I don't want you to teach this this morning. Let's go somewhere else. Well, that happens all the time, but because the Holy Spirit knows better than I do what you need today. And so let's let the Spirit of God, let's let Him lead us. See, Acts 13, 2 says, as they ministered to the Lord. They were in in a group setting, and they were ministering to the Lord, and they fasted, and that's where the Holy Ghost was able to talk in that moment. And so they stopped the service. They prophesied right there to, to uh, uh, Barnabas and Saul for the work that God had called them to. 1 Corinthians 14 talks about when people come together. Everybody has a gift. Everybody has a tongue. Everybody has a you know, prophecy, all these things. Talks about the giftings. And so there's not really a, a in the, there's not much in the Bible about order of service. Why? Because our services should be spirit-led, and what is our character? And this is the other thing that I, 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 want to, um, I want to say about this. Tradition can hinder the move of God in our church. Tradition can and will hinder the move of God in our church. So just because we get used to church a certain way. We just get used to a couple of songs, three or four songs, announcements, teaching. Just because we get used to it a certain way, if, if we say that's the only way that God can move, then we may miss an opportunity for God to really just come in with His glory and just do something spectacular in our services. Maybe it's just like one Wednesday night as people came up for healing. It was like one leg after another leg after another leg. God was in the business of healing legs that night. You know, give space to the Holy Spirit. Don't get so caught in tradition. And Jesus talked about that in Mark chapter um, 7. He said this. He said, you make the word of God of none effect through your tradition." which you have delivered, and many such things you do. Some people are more interested in tradition than they are the Word of God. That's right. When tradition trumps the Word, you're headed in the wrong direction. Yes, yes. But when the Word becomes the priority, then the church can be alive and growing. Amen? And then uh, I've already read this once, Galatians 5, 25. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. And I believe that also refers to uh, our church services. Let us walk in the Spirit in our church services. So let me read this in closing. I want to take all of these essential truths and put it together kind of in a paragraph so that you get an idea of what we're talking about here at the church. Here we go. As we understand, get a revelation of, the grace and truth of Jesus Christ, faith comes alive in our hearts and we begin to accurately hear the voice of God for ourselves. As we learn to hear and obey his voice, our giftings and callings are activated by his love for us and for others. And we are motivated into significant and sincere relationships with others through spirit-led acts of service. That is just all of those essential truths whittled down into one paragraph. You get a revelation of the grace of God, the love of God, 
Do you learn what it means to live by faith? As you do, you begin to hear the voice of God for yourself. As you begin to hear the voice of God and get a revelation and start living life for him in the way that he designed for you to and what he's designed for your life, then you begin to start recognizing those giftings and those callings that God has in you and that there are for other people. And as you begin to get a revelation of that, then you begin to build a relationship with people for the purpose of being a blessing to them and also for the purpose of valuing the gift and the callings that's in them. And then out of that, you just become this body of believers that, um, uh, that are part of spirit-led services. And man, it just becomes this glorious life. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we love you. Thank you, Father. Father, what I've tried to do this morning, the last week, is just try to, try by the Holy Spirit, I hope, to, to have painted a picture for everybody here of what, what life as a believer can be, what you've designed for it to be. It's glorious. It's glorious. None of us are insignificant. Every one of us were significant. Hallelujah. Father, I thank you for the giftings and the callings that you have for each and every person here. The value that you've placed on each and every one of us. Father, it's our desire as a church just to to be led by you. To follow you in every area of our life. And that through the the power of the Holy Ghost that is operating in our lives, people will be set free. I declare blind eyes will be opened. Deaf ears will be opened. The works that Jesus did, he said, the works that I do shall you do also. And greater works than these shall you do. And so, Father, this is a place. This is a place of miracles. This is a place that, it, uh, that, that your glory will be expressed through the lives of the people here. This is a place that people will come and maybe they've been poor, but we'll preach the gospel to the poor. And they'll be lifted up out of their poverty and in a place that they can uh, begin to be a blessing to others. As, as, you, as you prosper them, Father, as they are successful. Hallelujah.